Cattle culture among the Zulus goes back a very long way. In the times of the empire, for example, vassal chiefs would have paid their tribute in cattle. The cause of belly between various tribes would have been cattle, cattle raiding. A man such as Sugumisa can't, even today, can't get married until he's got a certain amount of cattle to pay his prospective bride's father. By the same token, he can't keep in touch with his ancestors unless he's got some cattle to sacrifice. So cattle are actually the very hub of Zulu life. Just as you see the crawl is in the center with all the huts going around, they are the most prized possession any family can have. In the days of the empire, warriors were mustered specifically to protect the royal herd. And ironically today, little Zulu boys get their first taste of stick fighting when they're out with the herds and they've got to protect their herds against other rival herdsmen trying to steal the best grazing. There's far more tradition alive out there than people tend to believe. Cattle are important for a lot of aspects. Probably one of the most is the fact that they provide milk for the young. As you see, Sugumisa is busy milking the cow right now. But for Sugumisa, ultimately, his most prized possession is going to be his bull. As a youngster, he's watched the bull fighting. He sees how it lines up for a fight. He sees the way it bellows, which is really a war cry. And in play, he'd have styled himself on his bull, on his father's bull, rather. And when he actually gets into a proper fight situation as a youth, he becomes that ferocious bull. And so when we see grown men fighting, we often see elements of a bullfight inside a stick fight situation. In Eddie Jardine's gym, we were discussing at what point fighting can become classified as an art. And it was decided, in fact, that it can only be classified as an art when and if certain art forms can be passed down from generation to generation. Gary, I think most people have this image of the samurai as being very, very pro professional and very competent warriors. And this is really so, because they start their training at a very, very young age. In fact, by the age of about six, a uh, samurai child would get his first bladed weapon. Uh, until then, he'd be playing with wooden replicas and possibly blunted weapons. And it was very interesting for me to see in Zululand how children of a similar age, say six, seven or eight, would actually be undergoing pretty severe training. Frog on. these little boys are using here are made from, or rather picked from, a special fibrous kind of a shrub that grows in the glades where they herd the cattle. They've always been used, even sh since Sharker's days, these are the switches that we used to train little boys, because they can't really hurt, but they sting. At this stage though, because they've got to put up with all the mockery and derision of their elders as they watch them play. But the elders, even though they're laughing and smiling, are actually watching for hidden talent. After all, stick fighting is a serious business, and the little lads have to take it seriously from the very onset. Liam, you mentioned that there's a similarity between these Zulu children and the children of the samurai some 400 years ago. Do you think that in Japan today there's something still as rigorous? Well, I certainly haven't seen anything as rigorous as this in Japan, and not for kids of this age. In other words, there's no necessity of, for kids this age to actually go out and uh, learn how to fight. Uh, of course, it would have been very different uh, three or four hundred years ago. A turning point would be the Battle of Nagashino in 1575. A classical samurai army was actually defeated by peasants using muskets. Nagashino is a very interesting battle. The three great uh, generals who actually unified Japan were all present at the battle on the side of the, the musketeers. These are the people who actually were using musketeers as, as a fighting force. Uh, they were ranged against the classical army of the Takeda family. The other reason that this battle is very interesting is that uh, military historians believe that this is probably the first example of the mass use of muskets in battle. In fact, uh, the Japanese had more musket, uh, musketeers deployed on this battlefield than any other contemporary battle in, in Europe. And I think this was the beginning of the end for, uh, let's say, things like sword fighting as a practical system. The tragedy and futility of that charge is very similar to the deciding battle of Alundi, where the pride of the Zulu Empire met the guns of the British. But the difference perhaps lies in the fact that today, the Zulus aren't allowed to carry guns at all, so they haven't progressed to another weapons stratum, as it were. And therefore, stick fighting as a natural form of self-defense is actually fostered and generated into a higher level. In the country, there's no instant police force like you got in the cities. And so a person or any group, any family groups, got to, got to have their own immediate kind of system of self-protection. It's difficult enough for city dwellers. Can you imagine now what it's like living out there in the country? It's even more difficult for a migrant worker who's working maybe 600 kilometers away to try and get time off to go and attend a lengthy litigation and he's likely to lose his job and a lot of money. And so it really makes a lot of sense that they have their own kind of 
you could almost say civil action, their own civil defense system, which is made up of neighbors, brothers, family, and in-laws. And this is a form of natural justice. A child's peers and his older brothers are very, very aware of the situation. And so it's from a very early age that they start teaching a young boy the basics of stick fighting. This is not in a demonstration form as we saw done, especially for the camera, but it actually happens right out in the bush when they're herding the cattle. And this is specifically so that if a little boy starts crying, he can't run away to mother. He's got to stand on his own two feet from the very start. The older boys will pit the small ones against each other, and if the little boy runs away, his older brothers will actually give him a good hiding. Over and above the fact that he's crying from the wealth he's just received, he'll get a hiding for running away. He must rather stand on his man and fall over than run. This is exactly the same way the Chaka's impis got trained in the early days. They got trained out herding the cattle. And it was from this raw material that Chaka was able to build a, mi a mighty fighting machine that he built. The older boys in this situation, if a little lad has really shown a lot of potential and shown a lot of guts in a fight, they'll wipe away his tears and they'll joke with him and they'll pat him and they'll play around with him a little bit and then they'll show him a few cunning little tricks and put him back into the fight again. And it was that kind of, of, of stimulus, with that kind of family unity, which actually built a cohesive group, which proves in, in, in later years perhaps that a group of five or six family people tightly knit together can withstand maybe 50 or 60 unwelded attackers. Dance has always been central to Zulu culture, as most African cultures, but it's got a specific application to fighting. Because in the dance, you've got a leader, and this actually is directly transposed into a formation fight situation where, again, they've got to obey a leader, and they've got to stand by, and they've got to be in exact unison. When these little lads are eligible, and they grow up to be flamboyant youths, and go dancing at various occasions, they'll actually have the maidens dancing around them and ululating to egg them on. <laughs> but in the meantime, they've got to put up with Granny performing this role. Civil Misa always the prankster has taken us to a situation where two little groups of rival herdsmen are sharing a guinea fowl that they've trapped. Now they're quite amicable to start with and they share it quite happily, but Zulu bush law states that there's one prized part, the part of any piece of meat has to be put on a stake between the two little groups. And this is almost like a prize. A bit of psychological warfare then ensues to see who's going to actually win this piece of meat. If one group retreats before, you know, before they actually fight, then the other group automatically takes the meat. But if they think they're equal to each other, Someone on either side will seize the stake with the meat inside. This is called Ugulupe, to take the prize meat. And this is an open declaration of war. It's in the game form, but it's actually part of their training. And once that meat has been seized, the fight's on. And in a case like this, while they were fighting, the dogs came in and ate the spoils of war. In a situation like this, 
when the one group runs away, it's very likely that tonight none of them will sleep at home because they know that their older brothers will be out to get them because of the fact that they've actually brought dishonor on the family name. And as it was, we found Subumita and Teto giving some of the kids a strenuous uh, refresher course. If Subumita, or any Zulu for that matter, finds one of his younger kinsmen who's showing extra special potential and courage at stick party, he'll take him aside on a daily basis, even when they're out of the cattle or at home, or just behind one of the huts, and he'll give him a bit of coaching. And he'll actually take him on as his particular protege. And he'll teach him some of the aspects of the art which he's learned, perhaps from older relatives or from his own hard experience. So when that child goes out to meet other clans people from another clan, he's already got a body of knowledge that he can call on. And it's this kind of a family force that he knows he's part of a family, he knows the family's going to back him up, which is probably most important when he first goes out to face an opponent. Another aspect which is probably similar to the Eastern martial arts is that there's a very important psychic phenomenon involved in stick fighting. There's a lot of mental preparation and spiritual preparation before one actually goes into a fight. Because if you go into a fight with any, what the Zulus call, darkness hanging over you, you're very likely to get hurt. So you've got to be completely clear in your own mind and be very, very concentrated on exactly why you're going into the fight and what you're going into the fight for. When a boy is about 16 and he gets his first mystical introduction to stick fighting, his older brothers will take him into a forest so that he can select his first fighting stick. Now, a fighting stick is very important to Zulu because the balance, the type of stick, everything about a stick is very, very unique to himself because ultimately he can only rely on his own force in a fight. While they're in there selecting a stick, his older relatives will actually teach him a bit about the natural medicines, about the types of herbs which can be used in battle when you've been wounded, about the type of herbs which are actually deemed necessary to ward off evil, etc. <laughs> There's a lot that goes into fighting sticks. There are probably 20 or 30 different types of sticks that one can select out of a given forest. And yet you'll find that certain families go for a certain type of stick because of the fact that they've always brought them good luck. And going into the forest situation like this for a young boy, we see him there with Sugumeso and Tetu, is actually a form of initiation. He's getting to know the forest, he's getting to know everything that it's got to offer him. The final part of any young fighter's training is when he goes to the shop and he buys himself this band. This is actually a kind of fighting war band. He'll then take it either to his teacher or to some experienced member of his family. And they'll put into it what's called in Zulu intelezi, which is actually a, a compound, some it's got mystical qualities, which is very difficult to explain to a westernized person. Some of these qualities, some of these uh, compounds are called things such as Impigay uh, Borni, the enemy can't see. And they're supposed to lend you a certain charm when you're fighting. Once he's got this armband and he puts it on his arm like this, and he goes out to, into his first duel, it's an incredible psychological importance, like I suppose talisman were to pilots in the Second World War. And without this armband, he'll find, he'll find himself feeling very lost in the battle. It's kind of psychological preparation. It's extremely important to a fight, I feel. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually very interesting because I think this is actually the outward symbol of his inner determination. That's right. And we have exactly the same thing in um, the Japanese martial arts, where you'll find someone will have what they call a hachimaki. Mm -hmm. and he will put this on. And you can see this even in modern day life. For example, people on strike will wear hachimakis as a symbol of their determination not to give in to their management. That reminds me of an amusing incident that happened when I was in Japan some years ago. Uh, a friend of mine and I were entered in a karate tournament, free fighting tournament. Mm -hmm. And we went along, 
my friend was wearing, as it happens, a, a simple sweatband like this. Mm -hmm. When he got on to, for his first fight, he got up, out, etc. went into fight, immediately there was consternation. The judge, oh, Dominic oh, yeah. and so on, <laughs> got quite carried away, ordered him out of the, the fighting area. Huh. And what we found out later was that uh, even though he was actually wearing a sweatband, they felt it was a kind of hachimaki. And that, that was a symbol of his determination. And suddenly, from being a sport karate, the whole thing had escalated, and that he was actually uh, uh, involved in a do or die thing. That's quite something. What that actually brings to mind, as far as Zulus are concerned, is the Zulu gear. And Zulu gear is another public display of one's prowess. It's actually in a kind of a dance form. It's a bit small to actually do it here, but it's a dance form wherein you fight against an imaginary enemy to show your dauntless courage and your willingness to do or die. And you fight against people on all sides, all at the same time. Why are you doing it? Your peer group behind you will be shouting praises. Some of these prizes have a bit of a right touch to them and, and, and it's in keeping with the whole Zulu performance that there's a certain element of drama and humor. For example, sometimes Sugumisa here, because he's a bit of a pr procrastinator, one of the praises that they shout for him, they say, you keep putting things off, putting things off, because you like a young girl who won't let men touch her. She only wants a boyfriend tomorrow. And you see, that's like making mockery of him in an uh, indirect way. But his fighting praises, however, when he's getting ready for real action, are you the fierce dogs who take him and pour him into a fiery furnace? They say dogs bark at you, but indeed, they welcome your approach. Just as you have offensive and defensive moves displayed in your gear, so in Karate Kata you also show off your uh, ability to fight again mm -hmm. offensive and defensive moves. I think there are some basic differences though. As I see it, a gear is much more the expression of your own individuality. Your That's own right. personality comes out very strongly, mm -hmm. your favorite moves, etc. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, in the Karate Kata, I feel to a certain extent your individuality is being submerged mm -hmm. because of the, the more formalized nature of Eastern martial arts, you know? So you would start off with a bow, perhaps, and then move in, doing very rigidly prescribed movements. I see. Okay, there, there's very little margin for error mm -hmm. as you go through these moves. Um, a second basic difference, I think, is that the gear functions more as an immediate thing. It's an immediate threat. You get up there, you're trying to dominate people, you're trying to show what you can to do. To psych yourself up to immediately. To psych yourself up and to psych them out. Right. Whereas the karate kata is more part of the standard training program. And I think I've got an example here. Uh, my teacher, uh, Bafdan Kwama, yes. does, if he does a gear, that's a gear. Right. When I do it, I don't think it's a gear anymore. I'm doing a kata because I'm actually imitating his movement. And you're doing uh, step for step, you're doing it the same. Right, I'm, I'm in imitating well, what he's sure. doing. I think a, a better example uh, or a better comparison would be with some of the Indonesian fighting arts. Comparison to the gear? To the gear, yes. I see. Because there you have... Uh, people who will actually, before a fight, circle each other. They'll be feeling each other out. So they'll be moving around, doing all sorts of elaborate hand and foot movements. Yeah. Uh, again, trying to psych out the opponent. Uh -huh. uh, if they succeed, the opponent or one of them may well back down, in which case the threat has succeeded. Mm. Now that correlates on one level, Ian. It definitely does correlate on a certain level. But something else I haven't spoken about relating to the gear, which I think is very important, is that very often, in a gear, a man will actually interpret himself as being a bull. He'll mm -hmm. even make a bull-type sound. And uh, the war cries often allude to an angry bull having changed his tune and stuff like that. So it's very, very deep in the psychology that a man actually aspires towards the fierce and dauntless spirit of a bull. Children, you'll find children out looking after the cattle. They make little clay bulls and they set at each other. In fact, if a certain little boy's bull loses, it's not uncommon for him to actually fight the other guy because mm -hmm. of the fact that it's such a point of pride. It's only a little clay bull. But that's how deep it is. Oh, in the they, what are they doing? Are they wrestling with them? Or well, they just, it's tactical. How they can come in and then they break the other bull's horn or something like that. Why? 
And men have such an <coughs> intimate relationship with bulls that I've actually seen, you know, in Zululand, I've seen a man who can speak to his bull as it sizes up for a fight with another bull and other owners with his bull. He can speak to his bull and on the command, pass me down, the bull will sink his head like this. And he, may, he might say, Puga, up, and then comes up with his head. And if he says, Tata, take him away, the bull jumps in. To me, that just shows how incredibly close the two fighting arts are. You know, the man actually, in a way, sees himself as a bull when he's fighting. Uh, baby, there's also a lot of animal influences in the Chinese martial arts. For example, the dragon, mm -hmm. the tiger, the crane, the monkey, and uh, some styles even imitate insects. For example, the penguin style, we have a certain move from there, then kick, strike, over, and like feeling like penguin. So you can see the impression. That's of the very impressive. Um, however, I think the closest to a gear like the gear that uh, Zulus do, I think the lion dancing is very close to that. In that every single club in China and Hong Kong have their own lion. Uh -huh. And uh, once or twice you go out into the street and perform your lion. And if certain uh, other clubs feel that your lion isn't strong enough, they'll actually challenge you to a fight. So for example, like there's uh, different ways of insulting your lion as well. For example, you smell his tail, and they'll be mean as a female, and they're big insulting. <laughs> That's pretty right. <laughs> variety of disciplines, okay, uh, at all levels. In other words, you have disciplines which are, are mainly uh, moral disciplines to improve your character, you have things that are still actually combat, mm -hmm. and then you have what is today sport. Right. Uh, I'd like to actually take a look at kendo and, you know, see how we, we ended up actually fighting in armor uh, with, with bamboo sticks <laughs> instead of actually sword, yeah. the, the live sword. Right. Uh, you've always had two disciplines associated with the sword in Japan. Mm -hmm. The one is Kenjutsu, mm -hmm. that was the original form that was uh, aggressive swordsmanship, in fact, military swordsmanship. And then you have what is called Ei Jutsu. Now, Ei is the art of the fast draw. With the advent of gunpowder, people uh, realized that from now on, warfare would actually be conducted by conscripts using guns instead of actually highly trained professional warriors who depended on bladed weapons. Mm -hmm. There was a very big changeover. As a result of this, there was quite a decline in the standard of swordsmanship. So what happened is that the sword started being used as a method more of discipline. All you have today is actually kata. Unlike Iaido, which is today a means of self-perfection, of, perfect, of perfecting your character, Kendo developed into a very, very exciting competitive sport. It's probably the most popular of the uh, so-called martial arts in Japan today. The Japanese have always had a special reverence for the sword, and uh, they still feel that 
Kendo is intimately associated with the sword. On the other hand, of course, the bamboo sword doesn't truly represent the bladed weapon. For example, techniques have changed. There are things that you can do with the bamboo sword which would be probably quite difficult to do with a real bladed weapon. But nevertheless, it is a, a very exciting and very dynamic uh, form of sport. You can see they've done a salutation and now they, they're squaring off. Now I'm going to try and relate what you said to Zulu stick fighting. Just as um, Kendo was a situation where two samurai warriors would fight each other to death, but today it's an exhilarating sport. We can relate this to Zululand. You saw how those little boys were being taught in a really harsh fashion. You know, they taught a ruthless self-defense form. Now in Durban is a, a sports club which actually teaches Zulu stick fighting as a sport, as well as a martial art, but the emphasis is on sport. When they heard we were actually filming in Zululand, they invited us to a contest. They said, well, bring your little fighters down and bring whatever fighters you've got and we'll see what happens in a hall. We were a little bit skeptical about this, but in the end we, we, we accepted the challenge and I think the outcome actually bears out a lot of what Liam was saying. It was when we first saw the children approaching that we realized the gap we we're going to try and bridge. Not the time gap Liam has spoken about between Kendo in its present form and the ancient art of the samurai over 400 years ago. The kind of gap we're talking about is an environmental gap between traditional children living out in the country and these city children who are actually now relearning the art of their forebears. Their dress and their manner of walking and their speech all spoke of people who were thoroughly urbanized and yet they were trying to get back towards their traditional culture. To the little country lads we brought with us, all this was new. They'd never seen the traffic lights before, let alone multi-storied buildings. And yet what seemed to impress them most was the fact that the other kids they met there were actually dressed in school uniforms and looking all neat and tidy and they just come along in the, in the kind of clothes they, they use in everyday life for herding the cattle. It struck me as though it was a psychological disadvantage because they were dressed in what seemed to be outlandish clothes. And so we slipped across into a little store and got some pretty new little shirts and gym shorts for them and they insisted, <laughs> as it happens, on getting some scants because they'd see that the little city kids wore scants underneath their traditional skins. And so at the end of the day, ironically, it was the country lads who were dressed in spivvy new little clothes, and the city lads had a reversal of roles. They were actually dressed in the traditional costume. Before the stick fighting started, the city kids gave us a display of Zulu dancing. It spoke very clearly of the type of dedication of, of their teachers towards Zulu culture but it actually did very, very little to reassure our little country lads who are feeling totally overawed by the whole situation. Recreational facilities are at a premium for black people. Two other clubs utilized the main hall in the evening and we had to move behind the curtains on the stage for the stick fighting. To break the ice, two of the city lads started doing a bit of a fight. But you can immediately notice the difference in style. They are far more delicate and they, they have quick little feints and jabs. But there's no hard going for it, the same as you'll see with the country boys.
To restore the confidence of the country lads, one of their older brothers started a famous war cry. The lyrics of this war cry go, We've shaken your spears, O Carp of His Highness, and it actually harks back to the days of the Empire. And thus inspired, the country boy went out to go and meet the city champion. can I say? Initially I was overjoyed that the country lad had won the clash so convincingly. For me at least it proved that stick fighting under simulated conditions can never be equal to stick fighting in its natural context. But this thing goes much deeper than that. Did you see the sheer courage the city boy used in the face of a superior opponent? His opponent was far better equipped both physically and in terms of his training. This says something to me about the future of stick fighting in the city. The Japanese can't go back to the naked sword, to the sheer brilliance of the samurai warrior whose very existence depended upon his ability and skill with a number of weapons. And the Zulus can't go back to this. And so, if stick fighting is to survive in South Africa, it may just have to be in the sports clubs. There are many alternative influences open to these youngsters, and as we left the stage at night, Providence supplied us with two of them. 